Hello everybody, this is Crystal. I'm going to try something new today. Um, since I'm all about saving money, I'm going to give you all a free reading of a free audiobook. Basically, this book is called A Taste of Chicken Soup for the Cat Lover's Soul. And, uh, and it is entitled, his little subtitle is Stories of Feline Affection, Mystery, and Charm. It is by Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen, Marty Becker, Carol Klein, and Amy D. Shojai. All of this information will be in the description box below because I don't want to take any credit from anybody and not give credit when credit is due. So without further ado, we will get into this book. I know that a lot of you people here like animal stories and also audiobooks are a good thing just to set and forget while you're going about your day or driving or reading or whatever. So I decided it would be good for me to do an audiobook on this channel. Maybe I'll do this again sometime, but for now, this is the first and only audiobook I'm doing, and it's called A Taste of Chicken Soup for the Cat Lover's Soul. Let's get started. The first section is called Laser the Therapist. The moment he reached his little paw through the cage bars at the Humane Society, I was a goner. I wasn't looking for another cat. I already had two, but was just stopping by to give the animals some attention. When the shelter volunteer, apparently knowing a sucker when she saw one, asked if I would like to hold him, there was no longer any doubt. He came home with me that day. He was a gorgeous cat, a five-month-old Blue Point Siamese with eyes like blue laser beams, thus his name. Right from the beginning, it was obvious that Laser was an exceptional cat. He loved everyone. The other cats, visitors to the house, even the dog who later joined the household. I first heard about animal assisted therapy several months after we adopted Laser. While most of what I heard was about dogs, it occurred to me that Laser would be perfect for this type of work. I signed up for the training class and after completing the preliminary requirements, Laser and I passed the test to become registered Delta Society pet partners. While he had always been a little love bug at home, Laser found his true calling when we began to go on visits. Whether it was with sick children at the children's hospital, seniors with Alzheimer's disease, or teens in a psychiatric unit, Laser always knew just what to do. He curled up on laps or beside bedbound patients and happily snuggled close. He never tried to get up until I moved him to the next person. People often commented that they had never seen a cat so calm and friendly. Even people who didn't like cats liked him. One young man who had been badly burned in a fire smiled for the first time since his accident when Laser nestled under his lap blanket. A little boy, tired and lethargic from terminal leukemia, rallied to smile, hug Laser and kiss his head, and then talked endlessly about Laser after the visits. Several geriatric patients with dementia who were agitated and uncommunicative prior to Laser's appearance calmed down and became talkative with each other and the staff after a visit from my therapeutic feline partner. It has been our hospice visits, though, that I consider most challenging and rewarding of all of our pet partner experiences. One day I got a phone call telling me about a hospice patient at a nearby nursing home who had requested a visit by a cat. At the time, only one cat, Laser, actively participated in the local program. Even so, my first inclination was to make some excuse not to do it. I have always had issues with death and dying, and a hard time talking about it to anyone, but I quickly realized how selfish I was being. The poor woman was dying and all she asked was that I bring my cat to visit. I said yes. A few days later we made our first visit. Mrs. P was 91 years old and although her body was weak, her mind was still very sharp. It was a little awkward at first. What do you say to a perfect stranger who knows she's dying? But Laser was a great conversation catalyst. He tr crawled into bed with her and curled up right next to her hip, exactly where her hand could rest on his back. She told me stories about the cat she and her husband had years ago. See you next week, she said as we got up to leave. We visited every Sunday during three months that followed, and a real friendship developed between us. Mrs. Pee Wee excitedly exclaimed, Laser! every time we appeared at her door. And see you next week, 
every time we left. She had gradually been getting weaker, but one week when we arrived to see her, I was distressed to see that her condition had deteriorated significantly. Still, she smiled and said, Laser, when we walked into the room. She complained of being cold, even though the room was warm. And when Laser cuddled up to her, she said, Oh, he's so warm. It feels so good. We had a nice visit, even though Mrs. P. wasn't feeling very well. Her hand never left Laser's back. As we left, she said her usual, See you next week. And I hoped that that was true. The next Saturday, a phone call informed me that Mrs. P. was going downhill rapidly, and she probably would live more than another few days. I asked we could we should still come for our visit and the nurse told me that she thought that would be wonderful when we arrived it was obvious mrs p was dying she was fading in and out of consciousness but when she noticed laser and i were beside her bed she smiled and whispered laser she was having a very hard time breathing so i told her not to try to talk we would just sit quietly and keep her company laser took his spot on the bed next to her up, and Mrs. P. rested her hand on his soft back. Neither of them moved from that position for the entire time of our visit. This time when we got up to leave, Mrs. P. whispered, Thank you. She knew that there would be no next week for us. A couple of days later, I got the phone call telling me that Mrs. P. had died. I was sad. Our weekly visits had been so wonderful, but I was glad that she was no longer in pain. I remembered how I had considered declining to make the hospice visits, and I was so grateful that I had not. In our seventh year as a pet partner team, Laser and I still make visits to several facilities. Laser, the little cat nobody wanted, is as beautiful on the inside as he is on the outside, and he continues to brighten the lives of everyone he meets. This little story was by Nancy Kusick, and her last name is spelled K-U-C-I-K. The next story is called Ringo the Hero Cat. We adopted our red tabby Manx Ringo from a litter of kittens found in a shed outside my mother's nursing home. His mother, who had half a tail, was feral. We fell in love with Ringo when he was only 10 days old. He had brilliant red fur, a tiny stump of a tail, bright blue eyes, and a high-pitched squeaky meow. How could we resist? At the time, we already had three cats and had made up our minds not to get another. Had we stuck to our promise, we would not be alive today. Ringo was special from the beginning. He had a wonderful personality and loved nearly everyone who came to visit. An expressive cat, he could move his little bunny puff of a tail in any direction he wanted, depending on how he felt. That red pom-pom tail could speak a thousand words. He was a a delight to live with, and as we were about to discover, a hero to boot. Throughout the late spring and summer of 1995, my husband Ray and I developed troubling symptoms, including dizziness, headaches, high blood pressure, and oversleeping. Ray was recovering from heart surgery, and I was laid up with a cast on my leg. Naturally, we thought these symptoms were a part of our illness. We were wrong. One hot August afternoon, we had the air conditioning going full blast and the doors and windows shut tight. Ringo, who was inside with us, started slamming his body against the front door of our house and wouldn't stop. In addition, he meowed loudly over and over. I had never seen him act this way before. Finally, I hobbled over and let him out. Once outside, he continued his loud meowing, acting as though he wanted to come back in. Again, I had never seen him act this way. His unusual behavior let me know that I was to follow him. I thought he was going to take me to one of his favorite spots. Instead, he led me to the south side of the house, a place on our property that we don't visit too often. Only our air conditioner and gas and water meters are there, hidden behind large bushes. Ringo began to dig in the jagged lava rock landscaping about three feet in front of the gas meter. Normally, a cat wouldn't dig these sharp stones as the edges could easily hurt a paw. Then he lifted his head, opened his mouth, and wrinkled his nose to let me know that something smelled awful. When I leaned down next to Ringo, the smell of natural gas nearly bowled me over. I called the gas company immediately. They sent out an emergency crew who told us that we were at explosive levels around our foundation. A pilot light or a spark outdoors was all that stood between us and oblivion. 
In addition, the gas had permeated the walls of our home and traveled up into our bedroom. Our doctor said if we escaped being killed by a deadly explosion, we would have still succumbed to methane poisoning. When the plumbers came, they found the leak about three feet in front of the gas meter, right where Ringo had dug. An old steel coupler had split open, and the crack was growing larger as a result of rust and corrosion. Ringo had smelled the escaping gas four feet beneath our landscaping. He led us to the gas leak that we couldn't smell, and the meter didn't register. What a nose for trouble. After we aired out the house, our health improved rapidly. For his outstanding heroism, Ringo received the American Humane Association Stillman Award. Only 10 cats in nearly 100 years have received this honor. While many pets have saved their families by insisting that they leave a hazardous situation, saving the pet's own life in the process, it is highly unusual for any animal to leave his family outdoors to alert them to the source of a lethal problem. Ringo, our guardian angel, is gone now, but his extraordinary love, love and heroic actions will remain with us always. And this story is by Carol Steiner. The next story is called Time with Marky. When I turned six, my father bundled my family into the station wagon and drove us to a farm out in the country. By the time we finally rumbled up the dirt road that led to the barnyard, two hours of road ruts and winding turns had reduced my stomach to sheer nerves. Whenever the car jostled from side to side, my stomach lurched precariously as waves of nausea rolled over me. A station wagon crested the last hill and rolled to a gentle stop. My sister and brother, Susan and Austin, a tangle of limbs fighting for the door, tumbled out and scrambled to the edge of a corral bordered by a weathered fence marked by fading chips of gray paint. Mr. White, the owner, was already leaning against the fence. A telltale dim of yips and yaps punctuated by an occasional yelp rose up and captured our attention like an unexpected eruption of fireworks against the night sky. I followed slowly behind, still nursing my overwrought stomach. The sight of several puppies frolicking in a patch of stamped grass lifted my spirits. Austin and Susan jumped up and down, pointing at each puppy in turn. That one, shouted Austin, the one with the white fur and black spots on his tail. I'll name him Spots. No, whined Susan. I like the brown one over there in the corner. He's got golden highlights on his ears. We can name him Sonny. I've changed my mind, continued Austin. I like that gray one. He has ears longer than my hands, and look how furry they are. I stood as still as a statue, afraid that the energy generated by the dogs and my siblings would be the undoing of my queasy stomach. Then I saw Marky. He appeared as a streak out of the corner of my eye. In a split second, I realized that streak was a cat. A cat! He had wavy gray fur and faint black rings on his tail and around his eyes. He separated from the circle of puppies and darted to the edge of the corral right where we stood. His eyes found mine. I looked back at him with a mixture of surprise and delight, but he wasn't the only one looking at me. Austin and Susan ceased their clamoring and studied us. This one here is Marky, said Mr. White. He's not a dog, as you can see, but no one's bothered to tell him that. He's the life of the bunch, friendly as heck. I looked down at Marky again. His eyes, soulful and direct, held a question. I must have answered that question to his satisfaction, because a moment later he swept his tail back and forth across the dusty ground. He was whacking his tail. He must like you, pronounced Mr. White with a chuckle. He usually doesn't wag at strangers. Dad, I whispered, tugging at his sleeve. I think he's the one for us. Just look at him. As if understanding my words, Marky turned his eyes toward my dad and gave him the same look he had just given me. We settled with Mr. White right then and there. Marky had never been in a car. In the back of the wagon, he slid back and forth, expressing his excitement over the passing scenery. He got himself too excited, though, because after a short meow, Marky threw up. He whimpered, then fell silent. I scrambled to the back seat and gathered Marky into my arms. We drove all the way home that way, his head cradled in my lap. In his new home, Marky soon became friends with just about anything that moved. His outgoing ways won over the entire neighborhood. Joey, my next door neighbor's dog, whether duped by Marky's canine act or merely accepting of Marky's peculiarities, arrived 
by our sliding door every evening after dinner to call Marky out to play. Marky was only too happy to oblige. But when everyone was busy taking care of other business in their lives, Marky liked to plop down in one corner of our porch under a row of wooden benches. He sat there for hours, staring up into the pale blue sky and out into the empty backyard. As soon as I stepped onto the porch and beckoned him, however, he had scooted his hind legs out from underneath the bench and scrambled eagerly over to me. We spent hours together roaming the woods behind the house. It really didn't matter what we did. Marky always had the time to play whenever I came looking for him. Then one day, Marky did not come home from one of his routine jaunts with Joey. I went to school the next morning, hoping that when I got home, I would find Marky biding his time in the corner of the porch. But he didn't appear, and a slow burning behind my eyes intensified. Crushed, I didn't tell anyone at school about Marky's disappearance. On the third day of his disappearance, a rumor began to circulate in the school hallways that a dead cat lay by the creek bordering the school's soccer field. My thoughts were weighed down with dread all day. As soon as school let out, too scared to go out on my own, I ran home and told my parents the rumor. My dad, stern and quiet, flinched at the news and left the house. It was then that my heart emptied. They found Marky by the creek. The vet told us that he was likely poisoned, but the police told us there wasn't anything they could do to catch the culprit. Several days after our discovery, I sat alone and forlorn in the corner of the porch while Marky once waited for me. I sat there remembering the happiness that he had brought into my life. All the tears I had kept to myself coursed down my cheeks and my body shook in small eruptions. After some time, I felt a presence by my side. I looked up and there sitting next to me, looking up into the pale blue sky with joy. I didn't move an inch. I didn't say one word. Joey looked over at me briefly, then turned his eyes back towards the sky. And there we sat, marking our times with Marky. I would carry the memory of Marky for years to come. When my grandpa died, I spent time sitting with my dad in front of the television. When my best friend broke up with her first love, I spent time eating ice cream and watching movies in her dorm room. When my mom was diagnosed with cancer, I spent time at home with her while she lay in bed suffering from the effects of chemotherapy. No words were necessary. I learned from Marky that one of the best gifts you can give to the ones you love is simply your time. This story was by Joanne Liu. The next story is called Happy Endings. It was a Saturday afternoon. As the Shelter Cat Adoption Program Director, I had just completed an adoption. Now I stood in the adult cat room looking around. The doors of the cat cages, we call them cat condos, were open. Yet some cats still lounged on the brightly colored flannel pads inside them. There were a few cats laying on the wide sunny window ledge, waiting and watching the world outside or just snoozing contentedly. I looked up and saw Otis walking along the catwalk, a network of boards suspended from the ceiling that cats access by climbing a tall, rope-covered column in the corner that doubles as a scratching post. Moo stuck his head through the cat door from the screened-in porch, just to make sure he wasn't missing anything important. Satisfied I wasn't bearing food, he withdrew his furry black and white head, and through the window I saw him leap gracefully onto one of the chairs on the porch to resume his nap in the dappled sunlight. The scene was one of pleasant, clean, feline serenity. What a difference a year makes, I thought. A year ago, Noah's Ark Animal Foundation's cats were all in foster care, as well as some cramped temporary housing in my own home. It hadn't been easy, but we had made it through. It had been just one more stage in our journey, rising from the ashes of the tragedy that had nearly destroyed us seven years before. In March, two, in March 1997, local teenage boys broke into our shelter, killing 17 cats and seriously injuring a dozen more. The story generated headlines across the country. It was even voted People Magazine's 1997 Story of the Year based on the level of reader response. When the young men were found guilty of only misdemeanors, many animal lovers were outraged, feeling that the boys had been let off with too light a punishment. Yet even this dark cloud had a silver lining. 
Using the incident as a banner, we at Noah's Ark, along with other animal welfare organizations, were able to persuade state legislators to stiffen the animal cruelty laws in Iowa and in several other states as well. But as an organization, we experienced some rough times. This tragedy had been traumatic for all involved, and it took a while to recover emotionally. Then five years later, we were forced to move from the facility we had been using for more than 10 years. We scrambled and found a temporary home for our shelter dogs on the farm of a generous couple who supported the foundation's work. The cats were scattered in homes throughout the area. We kept our doors open, rescuing and finding homes for as many dogs and cats as we could, as well as promoting spay neuter education and activities. In the meantime, we were slowly raising money to buy land to buy a new shelter. We were doing the best we could under the circumstance. The strain was enormous, and privately I wonder how much longer we could go on that way. Then a miracle happened, the kind that makes you pinch yourself to make sure you aren't dreaming. A fairy godmother appeared, waved her magic wand, and poof, we had our very own brand new shelter. Well, not exactly, but close. The administrator of a charitable foundation heard about our work. Our benefactress, who was appropriately named Miss Kitty, made a sizable donation which, in addition to the money we had already raised, enabled us to build a shelter, the beautiful modern Design for Animals building in which I now stood. Of course, it took a lot more than a poof to build the shelter. A great deal of work went into the research, design, and building of our facility because not only is our shelter clean and comfortable for animals, staff, volunteers, and visitors, it is also kind to the earth. Our building is green, which means it is energy efficient and has healthy air quality because it was built with non-toxic construction materials and designed to take advantage of the sun for lighting and thermal power. The cats and dogs at Noah's Ark really seem to like the building. This is important because even though we hope their stays will be brief, some animals spend a long time with us. Once we take an animal in, it remains with us until we find it a home, no matter how long that takes. Doing rescue work isn't always fun. There's a high level of frustration because we can't save them all and also because we worry when an animal doesn't seem to be adjusting well to shelter life or is returned after an unsuccessful adoption. Nevertheless, there are a lot of happy endings, and they are what keep us going. I smile thinking of the adoption I had just completed. Kenny left this afternoon in the arms of a woman who couldn't see him, but loved him all the same. Kimberly, is, who is blind, immediately fell in love with Kenny, a longtime Noah's Ark resident, who had been passed over repeatedly by other potential adopters, probably because he was considered too ordinary. A black, short-haired cat, no longer a kitten. Of course, Kenny had done his part. Kimberly just wanted a cat who would be drawn to her. Just a few moments after she took a seat in the adoption room rocking chair, Kenny was on her lap, extolling his own virtues in his own way. Sometimes I can only marvel at how these cat adoptions transpire. So often it seems that it is the cat or kitten who adopts the human family, not the other way around. In any case, Kenny and Kimberly connected in a way that was beyond mere visual attraction. It was a particularly satisfying, happy ending for me, because I knew how much Kenny had to give. Leaving the cat room, I looked around and said, Don't worry, guys. Soon it'll be your turn to go home with someone nice. Then I closed the door and walked through the happiest ending of all. Noah's Ark New Building which houses our reborn spirit and provides shelter for the steady stream of animals who need and receive our care. This story was by Janet Mullen. The next story is called The Call of the Lobster. Basil Rathcoon and his half-sister Agatha Coonstye were the first Maine Coon cats that I had ever had, and I quickly became accustomed to their trilling musical sounds, which my husband and I refer to as talking. Basil, a 22-pound male, is by far the more vocal of the two. As a kitten, he developed a particular language for talking to his favorite plaything, a stuffed toy lobster. The call of the lobster always occurred when Basil, carefully clutching the red toy in his jaws, moved his little friend. Every day, the lobster was taken to breakfast, to nap time, in Basil's bed, to watch television on the sofa, to dinner, and finally to bed. Of course, the lobster, Mr. Johnny on the spot, helped with various household chores such as doing the dishes or the laundry. Basil made sure that he and his friend participated in every activity that involved the family, so each time Basil moved his lobster, he would pick him up and explain to him, using his entire lung capacity, the next task on their agenda. 
No matter where I was in the house, I could always hear them coming. As so often happens in childhood friendships, I feared that the two would grow apart as Basil matured. But the two remained fast friends, even though the poor lobster suffered many tragedies, such as being dropped into the water bowl by Basil's jealous brother, Rochester, a long-haired red tabby. The lobster had to be washed, dried, and refitted with catnip, a minor surgical procedure, before he was fit to travel again. All seemed well, until one day when the toy disappeared and the call of the lobster ceased. My husband and I were saddened by the loss of the musical cries, but what we found was even more distressing. This was the change in Basil's behavior. Although he had always been a fantastic jumper, energetic, and a little too intelligent for his own good, he had never destroyed the furniture or broken anything fragile. So when he started stretching his arms through the upstairs banister in order to swipe at the artificial long stem flowers in an antique vase that it belonged to my deceased mother-in-law, I became upset. I fear that the sometimes naughty Rochester had taught Basil the art of attacking fake flowers. For several months, I moved the vase of flowers around the house to different locations. Each time, Basil would try amazing stunts to reach it. One day, disgusted by yet another of Basil's attempts to massacre the flowers, I picked up the vase to move it. My husband, who was standing nearby, said, Why is there a pair of eyes looking at me? Startled, I set the vase down on the dining room table and backed away. My fearless husband reached into the flowers and pulled out Basil's lobster. We sat down on the floor, called Basil to us, and reunited him with his wayward friend. Basil sniffed the lobster, then picked up his pal and marched him upstairs to the bedroom and placed him in a circular cat bed. For two days, the lobster remained grounded in the bedroom, but at the end of the lobster's detention, he was allowed to resume his normal traveling duties. Basil was now five years old. Sadly, the irreplaceable lobster was dunked one too many times in the water bowl by Rochester, so Basil adopted a red catnip stuffed mouse and a new loving friendship has developed. Even our female torty, Piewacket, caterwauls to her favorite friend, a green sparkling glitter ball, though she is not able to make the same musical sounds that Basil can. I am the only person I know whose pets have pets of their own, which makes me happy. It makes for happy times, if somewhat loud times. This story was by Susan Isaac. The next story is called Mayor Morris. In his younger days, our cat Morris, now 16 years old, was the mayor of our neighborhood, a stray I adopted from our local animal shelter when he was about 10 years old. Excuse me, when he was about a year old. Morris settled into his life as an apartment dweller quite easily, content to give up scavenging for meals and dodging dogs and cats for food from a can and a sunny square of carpet to nap on. Yet as happy as he was to have a home, Morris never completely gave up his love of the outdoors. He would sit for hours by the open bedroom window in our apartment, his nose pressed to the screen, sniffing the air and watching the activity in the park three stories down. At first, I thought he wanted to be out in the fresh air and sunshine, but soon I realized that it was the hustle and bustle of the outside world that he missed. When my husband and I moved to our first home, a red brick row house on a tiny street in Philadelphia, Morris would sit with us on our stoop or lounge in our middle school front yard, greeting the neighbors and holding court. In the spring, he had sit on our elderly neighbor's stoop a pace or two from our own door, supervising her attempts to plant flowers in her patch of dirt. On Halloween, he had wait at the front door for the trick-or-treaters, his amber eyes glinting in the candlelight from the jack-o'-lanterns. And when our daughter started walking, he had stationed himself on the sidewalk in front of the house, keeping a watchful eye on her as she clattered past him up and down the street behind her push toys. Morris never seemed to, seemed to want to venture more than a few feet from his own front door. A few years later, expecting twins and suddenly needing much more space, we bought our house in a nearby suburb on a quiet street that wound around in an elongated oval, beginning and ending at the top of the hill. The only traffic was the morning and evening rush of a half dozen cars taking neighbors to and from work and the mail and UPS vans making their occasional deliveries. One midsummer morning when we had been living there a few months, I walked to the end of our driveway to collect the newspaper, Morris trotting at my heels. Is that your cat? 
someone called as I bent to retrieve the papers. I straightened up. A trim woman in her 50s wearing bright pink walking shorts and a sleeveless button-down shirt was crossing the lawn towards me. I knew she lived in the house to the right of ours with her husband and a 20-something son, but I had not yet met her. I had not met many of our neighbors since I had been closeted in the house for most of the late spring and early summer, first on bed rest and then taking care of newborns. Yes, I said as she stepped onto my driveway. This is Morris and I'm Meg. It's nice to finally meet you. It's nice to meet you too, she said, introducing herself and shaking my hand. And it's nice to know your name, she said, squatting to scratch Morris by the ears. My husband will be happy too, she said, gazing up at me. Now he'll know what to call him, she said. My face must have shown my confusion because she laughed. My husband and your cat, Morris, have breakfast together on our patio every morning, she explained, standing up. One morning, just after you moved in, my husband went out with his coffee and the newspaper and found Morris sitting in one of his chairs. They had a lovely chat. Now Morris waits for him on the patio every morning. My husband reads the paper to him, and they discuss world events, don't you, Morris? Morris had apparently made more friends in the neighborhood than I had in the few months that we had been living there. Every morning, he'd meet our neighbor on his back porch for coffee and conversation. Then he had spent some time playing with the poodles in the house to the left, sitting in the grass at the edge of our driveway just beyond the boundary of their invisible fence while the dogs ran back and forth, barking and wagging their tails. When the fall came, he began ambling to the front of our driveway every afternoon to wait for the school bus to drop off the neighborhood kids at the top of the street. He would greet each kid as they came down the path past our house, accepting pats and scratches behind the ears. And on one Halloween, he took up his place next to the pumpkins and greeted the trick-or-treaters. Shortly before Thanksgiving every year, our f neighbors to the right would travel to Florida, where they would spend the winter. Morris took this as a sign to retreat into the house for the winter. In April, when the weather grew warm again, our neighbors would return and Morris would resume his daily round of social activities. But one spring, our neighbors didn't return. Instead, a for sale sign appeared in front of the house. Our neighbors had decided to stay in Florida. Their son told us when he came by one afternoon to check on the house. Oh, by the way, he said, getting into his car, my dad said to say hi to your cat. He really misses their conversations. I knew Morris missed those conversations, too. He still waited on the patio every morning for his friend to come out for breakfast. The house sold quickly to a Korean family with two teenage daughters and an elderly grandmother. They were friendly neighbors. The daughters always stopped to talk to our children when they were outside playing and the parents would wave and chat for a few minutes whenever we happened to be picking up our newspaper or getting into our cars at the same time. But the elderly grandmother never said a word, ducking her head and looking the other way a few times we had seen her in the front yard. I overheard her granddaughter speaking to her in Korean and I suspected that she didn't know any English. One summer warning I was watering the pants the plants on our back deck when I heard the soft quavering voice of the elderly grandmother on her patio below. She was speaking quickly and quietly, a steady stream of words in Korean. Occasionally she had paused as if asking a question, but I heard no voice answering back. She must be talking to herself, I thought. Quietly I peered over the deck railing. She was sitting at the wrought iron table with a cup of tea. Morris in the chair next to her was listening intently as she talked to him. The mayor of the neighborhood had done it again. Morris had a new breakfast companion, and our elderly Korean neighbor had a new friend. This story was by M. L. Sharondoff. This next story is entitled Coco's Cat. She looks bored, pronounced my daughter home from a short visit from college. We both studied the long-haired gray cat I had adopted the previous week from the D.C. Humane Society. Ever since I bought her home, Coco, who had been the most vivacious cat at the shelter, had been listless and apathetic. I tried changing her food, gave her vitamins, played with her more in the evenings. Nothing seemed to pique her interest. Maybe she needs a pet, smirked my know-it-all daughter. A few nights later, I was startled awake by a long, long mournful wail coming from a dark mound on the sill of my open bedroom window. Coco, for goodness sake, what is your problem? I said as I scooped her up and plopped her in her usual nighttime spot at the end of my bed. As soon as I had turned off the light, she jumped back down and resumed her wailing position. I won that round by depositing her on the other side of a closed bedroom door, but her scratching kept me awake most of the night. For the next couple of days, Coco spent most of her time on the windowsill, alternately meowing and wailing. 
all the while glaring accusingly at me. Let her out, advised my daughter over the phone from her college dorm. Are you serious? I said. Busy Wisconsin Avenue ran right in front of my apartment building. She wouldn't last long enough for me to double lock my door. After a few more days of listening to an emotionally distressed feline, one who was now on kitty hunger strike, I was ready to take my daughter's advice. But my second floor apartment was too high for a cat to come and go. I made a reconnaissance, excuse me, reconnaissance trip to the courtyard in back of my apartment building and looked up at the window, barred for inner city security. Coco stared down at me in silent appeal. I widened my gaze. An old wooden ladder was half hidden behind some shrubs. I leaned it against the building under my window. There was still a five foot gra gap, but it was worth a try. I tried not to think about the other city critters that might find the makeshift interest inviting as I opened the window up just enough for Coco to slip under. She had no problem jumping down to the top of the ladder. As I watched her disappear around the corner of the building, I prayed she'd be able to make the jump back up again and that she would be safe. I know it's irresponsible to let house cats outside, especially in a busy city, but Coco's need to go out was so intense I couldn't help but believe she knew what she was doing. Even so, I probably get glanced out the window every quarter hour for the rest of the afternoon. Just as I was starting to worry, I heard the rattle of the mini blind covering the door window. Coco jumped down to the floor, then turned to stare back out the window. Almost immediately, a black and white head pushed inside the blind. Coco gave an encouraging meow, and the newcomer jumped down. The cats touched noses as I stared in disbelief. The visiting cat wasn't very clean. Her spots were more gray than white, and she was extremely thin except for her belly, which showed obvious signs of late-stage pregnancy. I couldn't imagine how Coco had induced her to make that last five-foot jump onto the sill, let alone enter a strange apartment. But there she was, looking around my bedroom while Coco gently licked her neck and back. This is not a good idea, I grumbled as I put out a second dish of food and introduced the visitor at the, to the litter box. Tomorrow she has to go to the main society. After all, that's the responsible thing to do with stray cats, especially pregnant stray cats. Both cats ignored my comments. The next morning, I pulled my cat carrier from under my bed and went looking for the stray. She wasn't in any of the rooms of the apartment. Finally, I noticed Coco sneaking into my hall coat closet. When I opened the door, I found the visitor cat stretched out in a box of winter garments nursing four tiny fur balls. Okay, forget the humane society. How heartless would I have to be to turn out a new mother and four adorable babies? Polly, as I now call her, and her baby stayed in the closet for a couple of weeks until the babies got big enough and brave enough to venture out into the apartment. During that time, it was apparent Polly wasn't exhibiting natural maternal behavior. She didn't even groom herself, let alone the babies. Coco assumed responsibility for cleaning, cuddling, and playing with the kittens. Polly merely served as a wet nurse, showing no interest in her offspring, as Coco taught them to wash themselves and defend themselves and to use the litter box. In fact, Polly showed little interest in anything and spent most of her time staring into space. As soon as the kittens were weaned, I took her to the vet for spaying and shots. In the course of his examination, he discovered that Polly was deaf and possibly brain damaged. On the other hand, the kitties were active and curious as kittens everywhere, getting into everything and getting bigger each day. I decided I would keep Polly and started looking for adoptive homes for the kittens. Within a week, I found homes for all four. The day the last kitten left, Coco retreated under the couch and refused to come out for her evening meal, occasionally emitting soft kitty moans. The next day she was still there, no amount of coaxing would budge her. I thought about taking a sick day from work that was afraid my cat's depressed because she lost her foster kittens was not a legitimate excuse for absence. I rushed home after work and Coco failed to meet me at the door and then I looked under my couch. There was only empty space and shed fur. I made a tour of the apartment and finally found both cats curled up face to face in the box of winter clothes in the hall closet. Polly with both paws around Coco's necks. Coco looked up when I opened the door, but Polly just continued licking Coco's face. Both cats were purring loudly. Coco and Polly still live with me and are never very far away from each other. Coco never eats her food until she's sure Polly is beside her at her own dish and she faithfully grooms her daily. Polly remains unresponsive to my attention. She seems happy as cuddled up against Coco. I guess my daughter was right. Coco did need a pet, someone to take care of.
and Polly and her kittens would never have survived for long on their own. How Coco knew this, I'll never know. And somehow, by some instinct, Polly recognized when Coco was grieving and was able to offer the comfort she needed, comfort that could only come from another cat. This little story was by Sheila Souter. I'm going to take a quick break right here, and I will upload the rest of this book in the second half of my video. So, stay tuned. Thank you. Bye.